Hi, this is a quick revision of Caroline Duffy's Who Loves You. Uh, one of the first things we need to think about in relation to this poem is its actual subject. Um, I believe it's really concerning the insecurity of the poetic voice in the face of the absence of a loved one. And what, really what Duff is exploring throughout the poem is the kind of um, emotional landscape that's created by this absence. If we take a look at the structure, we've really got no regular rhythm, no rhyme scheme, and even these quatrains, which appear regular at first, are undermined by the time we get to the final stanza. So it creates a sense of uncertainty, a sense of disorder and chaos. Um, it reflects the kind of panic experienced by the poetic voice and the need to kind of control and impose some kind of order because of this uncertainty. If we take a look at the first stanza, there's an awful lot going on. I worry about you travelling. Well, first of all, we hear this very personal response. This seems to be about a specific incident. I worry about you travelling in those mystical machines. I don't know if you can actually see this kind of steampunk image, but mystical machines suggests machines which are fantastical, which don't have any right to work, and it's their capacity to fail that I think that um, Duff is really focusing on. That sense of the fantastic is also reflected in this uh, heavy alliteration, uh, mystical machines. The alliteration is quite contrived because those uh, consonant sounds are very close together and it maybe reflects the artificiality of using this kind of machinery like an aeroplane. Every day people fall from the clouds, dead. Well this is going to be our first example of kind of hyperbolic terms that are used throughout the poem. Every day, well, clearly not every day, but that's the sense of the poetic voice. This is happening really, really frequently. Every day people fall from the clouds, and then we get the cesura, dead. That pause reflects the kind of finality that's associated with this situation, and could also represent the fall itself. Breathe in and out, and in and out, easy. We begin with this imperative verb that suggests that need for control. The poetic voice is trying to, again, control and impose some kind of order on the situation. But it's also reflective of that kind of instruction to generate calm in a, in a moment of panic. It's the kind of thing I imagine in the context of when the oxygen masks come down in an aeroplane and the need to breathe slowly and deeply so that um, you know, the blood can be oxygenated and you can calm down. We then get to this motif that we get at the conclusion of each stanza. Safety, safely, safe home. And in terms of that, it's worth recognising that this kind of base lexeme of safe is repeated three times. It emphasises the poetic voice's focus. That's her concern, that the loved one is returned home safe and sound. And it doesn't matter whether it's a noun, an adverb or an adjective. It's the protection afforded by being home that's all-encompassing, hence the repetition. Going back to um, hyperbole in a moment, we get um, a sense of that through the way in which she's treating the photograph of the loved one. Your photograph is in the fridge, smiles when the light comes on. Um, there's this image of taking this portrait of the loved one, placing it in the fridge, it's secure, it's cool, it's contained, it's preserved, as are the other contents of a fridge. But the key thing here for this stanza is that it's cool. Because we get cool items referred to several times in contrast to what the poetic voice is concerned about. The potential to be burnt. Your photograph is in the fridge, smiles when the light comes on. All the time people are burnt in the public places. Rest where the cool trees drop to a gentle shade. So you've got this contrast between cool and burnt, hot and cold. And home affords cool. Away, without the protection of the poetic voice, there's the potential to be burnt. And that hyperbole, all the time, reflects the hyperbole that we witnessed in the first stanza as well. Third stanza continues this. There are all sorts of scenarios where potential harm is imagined at the you know, at behest of the uh, loved one. Don't lie down on the sands where the hole in the sky is. Again, hyperbole. 
Um, presumably she's talking about the hole in the uh, ozone layer, but there's this sense that the UV rays will inevitably kill. You know, even going sunbathing has the potential to harm the uh, loved one. And the effect is really pronounced through these emotive terms that are used. Nord to shreds. It's a really violent term that's employed. Well, both of those terms. Send me your voice however it comes across the oceans, presumably a phone call, to reassure about safety. There's that need for constant reassurance. And finally, and perhaps the most interesting stanza, is the one that concerns a potential mugging. The loveless men and homeless boys are out there and angry. I really like this parallelism. Loveless men and homeless boys. And I think the parallelism, because it suggests a connection between the two, conveys a sense of universality. There's a hell of a lot of danger out there. These people seem to be widespread. They seem to be ubiquitous. Nightly people end their lives in the shortcut. I think we've got two bits of ambiguity there, really clever plays on words. First of all, nightly people. Well, in one reading, we could have the idea of people of the night, people who go out in the night are endangered. They're the ones who are going to find their lives ending. And the suggestion is that that's the loved one. Don't go out at night, stay safe. But also, nightly people could be every night, nightly, every night people end their lives in these kinds of situations. Going back to, going back to the kind of hyperbole that we witnessed in the previous stanzas. End their lives in the shortcut. In other words, if the loved one takes a shortcut home, takes an alleyway, for example, they're likely to die. However, short cut would refer to a short cut of a knife by the mugger, and so that could be their end, the way they're killed. Once again, ambiguity. Walk in the light. This could be a reference back to the nightly people. You should literally walk in a light area, stay somewhere safe, but also walk in the light could metaphorically refer to being good. There's a sense of being religiously devout. Steadily hurry towards me. This is interesting as well, steadily hurry. It seems oxymoronic, doesn't it? It seems to be a tension there. How can you steadily hurry? It seems as if you know, we've got a contrast going on. But that's what's been the kind of tension and pull that the uh, poetic voice experiences between the kind of reality of the situation and the fantasy that's created by their panic. Safety, safely, safe home. Who loves you? The implied answer there is the poetic voice loves you. And that's why the poetic voice wants you to be safely home. Home is the place of protection. Home is the place of reassurance. Home is the place where there are no dangers. Okay, thank you.